For decades, Israel has faced attacks from Hezbollah in Lebanon, but since October the 7th, they've significantly increased. So what is the risk of this conflict spilling over? And can the Israelis really fight on multiple fronts? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Enda Brady. Now, as the war in Gaza has intensified, so too has support for Palestinians in neighboring countries. In Lebanon, Hezbollah has repeatedly warned it's not afraid to step up strikes against Israel. So far, it's a threat that has been taken seriously. Our correspondent, Linda Tamim, has more from Beirut. Tensions have flared between Iran-backed Hezbollah and the Israeli army ever since the beginning of the war on Gaza, with absolutely no sign of de-escalating so far. Hezbollah's chief, Said Hassan Nasrallah, has repeatedly clarified that operations along the Israeli-Lebanese border were an expression of solidarity with Gaza and explained that Hezbollah's operations depended on the way events unfolded there. He also said the group will continually assess the level of escalation it will pursue on the border and has made it clear they will not halt fire before a permanent ceasefire is implemented in Gaza. While Nasrallah initially indicated there won't be an immediate full-scale involvement in the war, the threat of war now appears to be more imminent than ever. In fact, for a while, the exchange of fire has been contained to just the south of Lebanon, mostly within towns along the border with Israel. But more recently, Israeli strikes have reached deeper into Lebanese territory, reaching as far as the outskirts of Baalbek in the northeast of the country. Now, it's important to note that the Iran-backed group is one of the most powerful militia forces standing up to Israel. They claim to have 100,000 fighters ready for war and over 150,000 missiles, mostly short-range ones, which could reach Tel Aviv. Now, the group is favored by a significant number of Lebanese, mostly Shia Muslims in, southern, uh, in the southern suburbs of Beirut and in South Lebanon. Many residents in the country, mostly Christians living in villages along the border, say a parallel confrontation between Hezbollah and Israel is dragging them into a conflict they did not choose. They fear their homes could be caught in the crossfire and that, would be, and that they would be forced to flee as a consequence. And just a reminder that according to the UN, Tens of thousands of residents had to flee their homes since the beginning of the, of the clashes on October 8th. Well, let's bring in our guests. Here in the studio, I'm joined by Chris Doyle, who's director of the Council for Arab-British Understanding, and Martin Smith. He is senior lecturer in Defence and International Affairs. That's at the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst. Welcome to Roundtable to both of you. Martin, what is Israel's game plan here with regard to Lebanon, do you think? I think Israel's principal incentive to do something in inverted commas is the displacement of the 70 or 80,000 Israeli civilians from towns and villages close to the border. That is not a situation that any Israeli prime minister could allow to um, can continue indefinitely. Uh, so in terms of the, the game plan, I think probably priority number one will be to prevent the situation from deteriorating still further until the situation in Gaza is damped down to the satisfaction of the Netanyahu government, whatever that may look like. Uh, and then my own sense is there's a 50-50 chance of the Israeli government seriously pursuing uh, a, a negotiated and some kind of diplomatic um, solution to the situation in Lebanon, which probably makes me, relatively speaking, something of an optimist. Um, because I think for two reasons. First of all, um, memories of the 2006, the first Israel Hezbollah war, are still very fresh in Israel as uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and the outcome of that was, was hardly a decisive victory from the Israeli point of view. And indeed, Hezbollah, in many respects, has become stronger, more entrenched uh, uh, since then. Uh, and secondly, because Israel, perhaps more positively, Israel would have to give up potentially relatively little to get a deal that would at least result in Hezbollah pulling back um, its forces and its short-range artillery uh, uh, from the border and therefore allowing the Israelis to be able to begin to, uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, repopulate the, uh, the depopulated towns and villages. Chris, just on that evacuation order, so tens of thousands of Israeli citizens displaced, now living in hotels presumably and other accommodation, 
that decision that the Israeli government made, was that a sign of weakness or was it just about protecting life? It was about protecting life. I don't think there's much doubt about that. And there is also a similar number of Lebanese who've had a move away in, in the south of Lebanon. And it certainly is a reason why no Israeli government can ignore what is going on and that this issue has to be resolved. So yes, the optimistic scenario, as Martin has outlined, is one where there could be an ag agreement at the end of all of this. But Israel is running a lot of risks here as well. And in terms of the attacks it's carried out uh, against Iranian targets in Syria, we've seen four so far this year, very ho high profile, particularly the one that took place only a few days ago, taking out two very high uh, members of the Iranian Revolutionary uh, Guard Corps. Now, I think also, though, you have to think in terms of the Israeli game plan, I'm not sure there is a single one. It's a very divided government, and there are different views on all of this, including what should happen to Gaza, but also in the broader region. So what might be the interest of Prime Minister Netanyahu might not be the same as that of Benny Gantz or that of Itamar ben Gavir or uh, Bezalel Smotrich. It's a very difficult situation. For Netanyahu himself, he needs a crisis. He needs to maintain this sense of emergency within Israel. For his own political survival, he knows the vultures are circling, waiting for him to fall, that opportune moment to kick him out. We now have Benny Gantz calling for elections. And only if Israel is under threat can Netanyahu reasonably expect to remain in office. And that's really, you know, here's somebody who has demonstrated over years, Israel's longest serving prime minister, an ability to do that and to manipulate the situation for his own ends. Well, I'm delighted to say after a few technical issues, we've been joined from Tunis by Eli Abu Aoun. He is visiting lecturer at St. Joseph University in Beirut and senior advisor Mina at Strategy International, which is a global think tank. Eli, welcome to Roundtable. Just give us your Thank impression you. of what is Israel's game plan with regard to Lebanon and that border? Uh, honestly, I don't think Israel has a game plan with regards to Lebanon. There is an, an ongoing internal debate within Israel and between the various Israeli institutions about what's the best way forward with Lebanon. Obviously, there is a consensus that uh, the threat coming from Lebanon, specifically from Hezbollah, is untenable. Uh, there's another priority for everyone in Israel is to get back uh, the, the communities, the, the people who are displaced from northern Israel. Uh, because of the of the of the security situation, uh, with, with, you know, and the shelling from Israel and uh, all of that, so uh, so there are uh, priorities that obviously a lot, most Israelis agree on. Uh, there is a consensus that the threat is untenable, but I'm not sure they have a plan on how to deal with it. There are a lot. There are there is a gap, and a lot of disagreements between, as I said, the various power structures within Israel about how to deal with, uh, with this threat specifically. Eli, what's the feeling like amongst Lebanese people when you speak to them about Israel right now? Are they worried? Uh, well, it depends on who you're talking to. If, I mean, uh, as you know, Lebanon is also a highly polarized and quite a divided society. And uh, yes, I, I would say there is a majority of civilians in Lebanon who are... Uh, who are afraid, who are concerned about a uh, large-scale military operation that Israel can carry out in Lebanon uh, to deal with Hezbollah. Uh, as you know, since 2019, Lebanon has been going through a very tough financial and economic crisis. Uh, and although, you know, the situation looks a little bit better, although it's not really better, but it looks better to some people, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, Lebanese are still feeling the heat of this financial crisis. And the assumption is that any war will just exacerbate this financial and economic crisis. Uh, also, a lot of Lebanese understand that the, uh, the, uh, the international attention that we got after 2006, uh, after the war with, with Israel, uh, is not uh, something that could, we should expect now when it comes to how much money we'll get for reconstruction, 
uh, and for uh, economic assistance. So we are also afraid, or a lot of Lebanese are actually afraid, that uh, this time around uh, the reconstruction process will not go as fast as it went after the 2006 war. So there are a lot of reasons why most Lebanese uh, are afraid. Uh, there is a minority of Lebanese who uh, basically who form the constituency of Hezbollah in Lebanon and who are less concerned about all of these aspects and who consider that uh, defeating Israel is uh, or remains a priority and no matter what the cost is, etc. But this is a real minority, even within the Shia constituency, within uh, communities who traditionally would vote for Hezbollah, there is a lot of concern about uh, a large scale military operation that could, as I said, exacerbate the existing crisis. Ellie. We know there are cracks in Lebanon and Lebanese politics. Do you think Israel senses a weakness there and finally an opportunity to sort out the Hezbollah issue once and for all? Uh, yeah, I like, I like the terminology. There are cracks. I think this is a nice euphemism. There, is a very strong, there are very strong divisions in Lebanon. So uh, the the popular support for Hezbollah has, within the Shia community more specifically uh, has been growing. And uh, a lot of Lebanese uh, aware of the realities on the ground. They understand that uh, even a war will not resolve the problem of Hezbollah. It takes a regional war that, uh, that needs to uh, involve Iran and Syria in order to resolve the problem of Hezbollah. Just, you know, striking Lebanon uh, alone is not going to resolve the problem. Uh, so it's either there is a holistic strategy to deal with Iran and its proxies, including Hezbollah, or otherwise, I think that uh, any other war would be would just be more destruction, more killing, uh, w without uh, really uh, neutralizing uh, Hezbollah. Martin, we've seen the Israeli military struggling for recruits even talking about conscripting Orthodox Jewish men of fighting age, which they obviously don't want in the Haredi community. I mean, has Israel got the capacity to fight on two fronts? Uh, potentially, it has the capacity because it, it, it has a, 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 a significant mobilizable reserve, um, which it mobilized in the early stages of the current campaign in Gaza and then partially demobilized again. So in principle, they could be, those reservists could be remobilized and sent to the Northern Front. If you think about capacity in the sort of wider societal and political uh, sense, this is where I think it's more doubtful. Uh, uh, and I think that there is um, a, a sense of a potential, if you like, bandwidth problem for Israel here, um, on the, in, in the view of both um, a significant number of Israeli politicians and indeed military um, IDF commanders, as well as in Israeli society uh, and more generally, could and would and should Israel um, risk getting involved in a potentially very protracted um, two-front um, uh, conflict, the, Gaza, the continuing Gaza front, which shows no. Um, a, a way of ending as yet from the point of view of an acceptable um, outcome from the, uh, uh, the perspective of either Israeli government or society, then potentially getting into another conflict with Hezbollah. And again, fairly recent memories of 18 years ago, that was quite a traumatic experience. It's traumatic for the IDF, it was traumatic for the then Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Olmert, and it was traumatic for wider Israeli society, precisely because it by no means could be represented as having resulted in any sort of definitive or decisive victory, or indeed a decisive outcome at all, from Israel's point of view. All the problems that Israel had to contend with at the start of that campaign, the disputed border, uh, Hezbollah operating right up to the northern, um, uh, the northern border uh, with Israel, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the situation where the, the Lebanese state was just too weak to be able to um, 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 actively constrain, constrain or control Hezbollah, all of those were just as much, pre as much present at the end of that conflict as they were at the beginning. And since then, if anything, Hezbollah, militarily at least, has become even more entrenched 
and significantly stronger. Uh, according to some analysts, it had something like 15,000 missiles in its arsenal at the start of the 2006 conflict, and it has up to potentially 150,000, so a 10 times more available now, um, 18 years after that first conflict. So I don't detect there's any great groundswell of, 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 of opinion supporting um, uh, and a significant military escalation. I think in that context, it was significant that uh, just a few days ago, Defence Minister Gallant, who was known as one of the more hawkish members of the Netanyahu uh, government, actually publicly said that um, if Israel did find itself being drawn into an, a, 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 an enhanced, uh, a, a, an escalating conflict situation with Lebanon, that would be very hard, his words, that would be very hard for the state of Israel to be able to prosecute that successfully. Chris, Hezbollah are better trained than Hamas, better equipped, better financed. Why would Israel pick a fight here? Israel might see the opportunity right now to take Hezbollah out because it is that serious threat in a way that Hamas was deemed not to be. Obviously, the events, the atrocities of the 7th of October somewhat shook that. But no question, Hezbollah is a much more potent threat. And remember, of course, that Hezbollah also battle-hardened. They've been fighting in Syria. Uh, these guys are, are not raw recruits. Uh, a lot of them have seen some really fierce combat. So the, the Israelis know that they would have a really significant struggle on, on their hands. And it's really a difficult uh, problem for them to actually unravel. Not only that, remember that there, there's an estimate that came out in the Hebrew media recently that shows that the cost of the Israeli economy, and this was by the middle of February, was about $60 billion. So you have also an economic cost to this that the Israelis are now going to be feeling really uh, the pinch of all of this. It doesn't compare to what Ellie was describing that has hit Lebanon since 2019 by any stretch. But for Israelis who've lived a comfortable life, you know, uh, middle class professionals, this will hurt. And a war with Lebanon, where there would almost certainly be more destruction uh, on Israeli communities, uh, is going to hurt them even more. So I would think if they actually chose to take on Hezbollah, the level of aggression, particularly in the first strikes, would be enormous. I think it would put uh, you know, Gaza in the shade, so to speak. But they're hoping, I think, that what they've done in Gaza will act in some way as a deterrent, that it demonstrates that they can pretty much do whatever they like, whether it's bombing host hospitals, other civilian infrastructure, and get away with it. And that will be you know, understood in Lebanon and amongst the Hezbollah leadership. Ellie, I noticed recently that the Christian Maronite leader in Lebanon urged your country to stay on the sidelines. That was the phrase he used. I mean, what do people think on the ground? Do they, and I appreciate there are different religious leaders and factions, but would most reasonable citizens think that that is absolutely the right course or path to take? Yes, uh, as I told you before, there are a lot of Lebanese, the majority of Lebanese actually are really uh, scared about the prospects of a war uh, against Lebanon. And uh, possibly the, the Maronite leaders, uh, the, the I think you're referring specifically to the Patriarch, uh, have more visibility in the international media than, than other religious leaders. Uh, this is why you may hear them uh, more frequently or better than, than others. But in Lebanon, if you follow the media in Lebanon and what's happening, there are voices from almost all communities uh, expressing the same uh, wish for Lebanon to stay on the sideline to the extent possible. Uh, because the assumption is that Lebanon cannot afford uh, being dragged into a war of, of that scale. Uh, and this is, this is a good excuse because, uh, you know, for some Christians or some Christian political groups, maybe they feel less empathy with, with the Palestinians in Gaza. But even Lebanese who feel empathy with like Sunnis or Druze or other communities in Lebanon who feel more empathy with Gaza, with, with Palestinians in Gaza, they are also afraid of a war. So there is a sort of, uh, over, you know, I would say prevailing uh, concern in Lebanon. Uh, that is trans-sectarian uh, uh, for once, uh, about uh, not being dragged into this war. Martin, 
Netanyahu knows that as soon as conflict stops, he's toast. Is, is that the driving force behind him right now? I think, as Chris alluded to, it, from his personal and political perspective, uh, I think the answer is yes, that's a substantial uh, driving force. But if we know anything at all about Israeli politics, well, that we, we know, in fact, two things. Number one, it's famously fractious and divisive. And number two, um, the record suggests that few Israeli prime ministers are as secure in their jobs as it may seem to the outside world. So, clearly, Mr. Netanyahu, Netanyahu has his own personal and political agenda, um, but ultimately, what will determine, uh, I think, more both how things um, ultimately end up in Gaza, whether there is a ramping up from the Israeli uh, side of um, escalation with regard to Hezbollah, and more widely, um, the political future of the current government, that will depend at least as much on um, key members, not just of Mr. Net Mr. Netanyahu's own party and coalition, but also the war cabinet and the principal one, the one that's gathered most of the attention, as Chris alluded to, uh, is Benny Gantz. So, Ben, Mr. Netanyahu, I think, uh, it may well be less secure and less entrenched uh, domestically than he might appear uh, to many of us in the wider international arena. Chris, is it a victory for Hezbollah already that all these towns and villages in northern Israel are completely isolated and almost uninhabitable as long as this tension goes on? I mean, Hezbollah must be happy with that effect. I think it's hard to see any side coming out of this at the moment as victors. It's not yet reached the sort of scale that we saw in 2006 where Hezbollah can make this argument that somehow they survived the Israeli onslaught and therefore aren't they all heroes. That was the sort of message that came out. But I think Hezbollah is also concerned. It's vulnerable to regional events. And I'd look very closely at what Israel has done in, in Syria recently. and. By bombing a diplomatic premises in Damascus, it's sending a message to Iran that basically we are prepared to go after you pretty much wherever, especially outside of Iran itself. We're not going to be thwarted or put off by the risks of escalation. And over to you, what are you going to do in response? And what will Iran's response to that? Now, it could be through Lebanon. It could be via Hezbollah but they have to take a very careful look at the, this and the risks for them. There's a medium intensity conflict right now where nearly every day there's, you know, tit for tat. And those attacks across the border from both sides have gone deeper and more potent. In February, we saw an attack just west of Baalbek. It's very, very dangerous. And you could get a situation where a war breaks out, not by the intent of one party or the other. It could happen because things escalate and then suddenly gets out of control. And before you know it, you're in a full scale war. And this is where I think the criticism of the international community comes in. What is the international community doing to de-escalate all of this, given the really serious potential consequences if we see a regional conflict, if we see this breaking out between Israel and Hezbollah and other countries that will be destabilized. Europe worries about refugee flows. Well, imagine the sort of refugee flows if this really escalates in the worst case scenario. Ellie, final question to you. Just give us your prediction for the next couple of months, if you will, for Lebanon. I mean, can you see your country staying out of this or, or being dragged in? Well, I think it's very hard to predict. It depends pretty much on what the Israelis decide to do. Uh, uh, as long as Hezbollah is concerned, I don't think that they're going to escalate uh, by themselves. I think Hezbollah is also very risk averse in this case, uh, as much as are the Iranians, uh, because both of them know that uh, getting into a war will be costly for both of them. Uh, Iran is specifically concerned about being dragged into a conventional war. So not only Israel, but if other Western countries join the coalition, that would be detrimental for the Iranians. So there are a lot of reasons why neither Hezbollah nor the Iranians are really enthusiastic about uh, having a larger scale uh, conflict or, or more escalation. Uh, 
Uh, however, if Israel decides to strike and to uh, uh, basically upscale uh, the the type, the nature of the strikes against uh, the targets in Lebanon, then they will have, uh, you know, Hezbollah will find itself in a position, uh, or they will find themselves compelled to react in one way or another. So it's really uncertain. I personally, I don't see uh, one scenario being more probable than the other. Uh, and uh, I think it's very hard to predict what will happen exactly. Uh, but it is it is a risky situation. Uh, we know that Hezbollah, the Iranians and the Americans and a lot of regional countries want to avoid uh, a larger escalation. But as I said in the beginning, the Israelis are still debating how to deal with Hezbollah. There's one thing that is sure is that Israel cannot accept the threat as it is. So they need, they need to do something about it. I don't know what they will do. And what will happen in Lebanon depends on what will they do exactly. Ellie, Chris, Martin, thank you all so much for your insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.